When I think of space exploration, I usually think of enterprising space explorers from the future or bug-eyed aliens who traveled untold numbers of light years to scope us out. And that's weird. I'm a science journalist and my brain goes straight to fiction without even considering how real scientists are investigating our own solar system. That's changing now though because of a story involving some wild space chemistry that I learned about from my friend Joanna who writes for the science magazine EOS. Hey. Oh, hi. <laughs> so, on its surface, this story is about one of Saturn's moons, Titan, and it's totally unexpected chemistry. But at its core, it's about how the things scientists are learning about Titan are shaping the way we think about our own planet and our own solar system. Let me set the stage for you. Almost exactly 20 years ago, humanity embarked on its first mission to orbit Saturn. The Cassini-Huygens mission is a collaboration between the National Aeronautics and Space Administration, NASA, that's the one, and the European Space Agency. ESA? Maybe? I say ESA. Anywho, Cassini-Huygens entered Saturn's orbit in 2004, which is when the mission split into its two major parts. Huygens is a small probe that detached from Cassini orbiter and parachuted onto Titan's surface in early 2005. Meanwhile, Cassini kept doing laps around the Saturn system. That's where our chemistry story actually comes from. Cassini has a pretty tight relationship with Titan. The spacecraft flew through Titan's atmosphere, and Titan's gravity is actually going to provide Cassini with the force it needs to end its mission in just a few days by flinging it into Saturn's atmosphere where it will burn up. I know, but let's not focus on that right now. Instead, think about what we've learned from this mission. It literally discovered new moons of Saturn. It explored the plumes of the moon Enceladus, and it revealed some amazing chemistry on Titan. Yeah, so what is so special about Titan? I'm glad you asked. I know the perfect person to answer that question. She's over at Johns Hopkins University. Let me introduce you to Sarah Hurst, planetary scientist and Titan evangelist. When people are like, what is so interesting about Titan? I always just want to be like, what isn't interesting about Titan? Let me start there. Oh wait, there's nothing. <laughs> the kind of most basic thing we know about Titan's atmosphere is that it has one, which is weird. So it's the only moon in the solar system that has a substantial atmosphere. Then the second thing we know is that it's mostly nitrogen. So the atmosphere is about 98% molecular nitrogen. So it's the only other substantial molecular nitrogen atmosphere in the solar system besides ours here on Earth. So just those two things mean that Titan is, is one of the most interesting objects in the solar system, in my opinion. As life evolved on Earth, it began putting a whole bunch of oxygen in our atmosphere. That's not happening on Titan. So this moon is like a window into our past that lets researchers explore what Earth's atmosphere may have been like and what it was capable of before life took root. One of the big questions is, can atmospheric chemistry actually create molecules to kickstart life? But that's not the only thing that makes Titan so intriguing. Titan's atmospheric chemistry is just absurdly complex. So the heaviest molecule that had been detected in Titan's atmosphere before Cassini got there was benzene, which is C6H6. So it has a mass of 78. I think our idea of complexity was kind of like, oh, there's benzene in Titan's atmosphere. Like That's a super complex molecule to find in an atmosphere. This is going to be really exciting. Then Cassini got there, and the mass spectrometer on Cassini, which is the ion and neutral mass spectrometer, only goes up to a mass of 100, so it only goes a little bit heavier than benzene. So of course they do the first fly through of Titan's atmosphere and their signal all the way up to 100. And so immediately you know you sent the wrong instrument. The, the thing that was lucky um, for us is that there's another instrument on Cassini called CAPS. It's the Cassini Plasma Spectrometer which was designed to study the plasma environment in the Saturn system, right? So it was meant to be studying small energetic ions, so electrons, protons, <laughs> oxygen. When CAPS was on during the Titan flybys, they started getting these really weird signals. It turned out what CAPS was detecting were negative ions that have a mass up to 10,000. So that's like 800 carbon atoms <laughs> rather than like the six that we have in benzene. Now, researchers published this CAPS data about 10 years ago when Sarah was a graduate student. She was developing computer models of Titan's atmosphere, and these results were so unexpected they changed the course of her career. But more on that in a second. First, let's talk about the CAPS data. Even though CAPS was designed to look at the small particles Sarah mentioned, it doesn't actually measure mass, it measures energy. When CAPS was flying through Titan's upper atmosphere, it was screaming through a sea of cold ions, charged particles with low thermal energy. The ions were basically just chilling there as Cassini flew through them at six kilometers per second. So CAPS measured the energy of the cold ions and scientists knew their speed relative to the spacecraft at six kilometers per second. Some basic physics could then give them the particle's mass. 
Here's Hunter Waite, the principal investigator on Cassini's math spec and CAPS instruments. You get the mass from just the one-half mv squared, the kinetic energy. So it's kind of a poor man's mass spectrometer, but it worked pretty darn well. And again, it's not like scientists didn't expect to see stuff in Titan's atmosphere, but they weren't expecting the stuff to be so big or that they would find it where they did. This was surprising in that the particles were so massive. You know, everybody realized that there was aerosol surrounding Titan, but the last thing any of us thought was that they were all being created a thousand kilometers above the surface. So now the obvious question is, what exactly are these aerosols made out of? We don't know. What? Yeah. Remember, the ions are too big for Cassini's mass spec, and CAPS wasn't made to ID monster molecules. This sort of complication is basically par for the course for scientists studying Titan. If Titan would ever just once like give up one of its secrets easily <laughs> instead of making us work so hard, um, it, wouldn't, it wouldn't be Titan, of course. Which brings us back to Sarah's work. Remember how I said the CAPS data changed the course of her research? She went from using computers to model Titan's atmosphere to approximating the moon in experiments. Her team built a chamber where it can create conditions that are Titan-like, so it can use gases, temperatures, and pressures that would be present on Titan. Once they have those variables set in the chamber, they supply energy with UV light or plasma discharge to see what chemistry is possible in that environment. But remember, they can change the conditions, so the experiments aren't limited to Titan. They test environments inspired by Pluto or Venus or extrasolar planets. Basically, they've got a system on Earth that can explore the atmospheric chemistry that's possible out there. Now that we have this chamber in our lab, we can make any atmosphere we want. And so we're uh, just kind of running around all over the solar system and the universe at this point, um, trying to figure out what's happening in all of these different atmospheres. Of course, there are limitations. For instance, they run experiments for three days, not the eons the universe has had to evolve its chemical complexities. We're not making the perfect conditions in the lab. We're doing the best that we can. And, you know, so I could save NASA a lot of money if I could just make Titan in my lab. <laughs> but unfortunately, that's not actually possible. These lab experiments, along with computer simulations and telescope observations, are giving us a better understanding of what's happening out there and how. Still, there are some questions you can only answer by being there, so some of these chemical mysteries will remain until we go back. Telescopes are amazing. We do so much amazing work from the ground and from space-based observatories, and we can do all this modeling and all these experiments, but there are certain measurements where you just have to physically go there because it's the only way to do it. So when might we see another mission back to Titan? Well, there are totally proposals to go back. Researchers are talking about sending a quadcopter or a submarine to Titan, but it'll be a long time before a mission actually makes it there. Brutal. I know, it's a bummer we're not going back to Titan anytime soon, but we've literally been talking about one set of data from one instrument on one mission to one planet in our solar system. There are loads of other space probes out there and more are planned. For instance, NASA's planning to send a mission to Jupiter's moon Europa sometime in the 2020s. And ESA's Jupiter Icy Moons Explorer, or JUICE, is slated to launch in 2022. So we've got a lot to look forward to. Totally. And that said, it is a downer that Cassini's ending. Yeah, and you wrote a story about that for EAS, right? I sure did. Awesome. We've got a link to that in the description, along with much more. So which of the upcoming missions are you most juiced up about? Let us know in the comments. You know, I think each mission will just be crater and crater than the last. Was that a moon pun? No, it was a late heavy bombardment pun, duh. Thanks for watching. <laughs>